So yeah, welcome everyone. Thanks a lot for Nanopore for inviting me to this event. Uh, it's my first time in London calling. It's been really amazing. All these great talks over the last two days. Um, really great venue and hope to be back at some stage. Um, so today I want to talk about our latest work uh, on structure variant identification, uh, really from mosaic to population level. Um, as the previous speaker already showed us um, nicely, structure variants often loosely defined as 50 base pairs or larger genomic alterations. And despite the fact we are just finding like below 1% in terms of numbers compared to SNVs, they're actually impacting a higher number of base pairs all across the human genome. We cannot differentiate them between five different types being deletions, duplications, insertions, inversions, and tandem and translocations. We can identify them utilizing split reads where two or more regions of the same read are aligned to different places in the human genome, for example. So structure variants are really important, I want to stress this point. Um, being it, for example, in evolution, where we can talk about gene gains and gene losses, and we have also identified multiple speciation events leading, coming from structure variants. But of course, today I'm more focusing on genomic disorders, such as, for example, in humans, where here you can see a cancer diagram of SKBF3, a HER2 positive breast cancer cell line, but we're also studying it, cardiovascular disease, neurological diseases, or other diseases. Um, I was also fortunate to team up with ENCODE and GTAC and identify the impact of structure variants on regulation itself. And then the last point I want to make on the lower right is uh, that they are also contributing to several phenotypes. So here I'm showing you some hand-selected phenotypes, of course. In red, you can see the contributions of copy number changes, in black, in rearrangements, and in creation SNPs. And my point is always in this slide is only when you take together all these different genomic variations uh, we can really improve our understanding of certain phenotypes. So over the years, and as you have heard in this conference all over again, um, it was really getting clearer and clearer, and we published also multiple papers in my group about that, long, that structure variant calling with long reads just works better. Uh, we usually detect around something like 25,000 structure variants in a, human, in a healthy human genome, whereas short reads are like the short, I like, I like the choke, basically fell short, in identifying complex alleles or insertions. Um, long reads also allow us access in repetitive regions, such as some of them are really medical relevance, as Mendekler showed, but also it's going to be going really interesting for the future applications to investigate centromeres and telomeres and the variations that we have been so far uh, blind to. And then one point that is often, I think, a little bit ignored is the really impo uh, important part of phasing where we can identify if two alleles are co-occurring on the same molecule, which has kind of great implications um, for expression, for example. So with all these advancements, it wasn't that surprising that more and more studies are coming out that utilize long reads uh, platform. And as, that, as such, uh, we were convinced that it's kind of time to upgrade Sniffles to Sniffles version 2. So here is kind of already the first uh, benchmark that I'm showing you from Gino on the Bottle. Um, you can see on the x-axis it's CPU time, on the y-axis you have the genotype F1 accuracy, basically a, 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 a measurement of precision and sensitivity. In orange you see the, fir the first version of our method, uh, Sniffles 1. Uh, you can see it actually performs quite well with different coverage levels, but it's been really time to upgrade this thing. Uh, then we of course assessed also other tools. Uh, in the tick marks you see the different coverage levels that we assessed from 5 to 50 co x coverage. And in dark blue on the top left, you see Sniffles 2, basically really kicking ass, so to speak. Um, not just in speed, but also in sensitivity. But it was also remarkable we can achieve with 5x coverage a really high sensitivity and accuracy with just Oxford Nanopore, right? And this is possible because Moritz, who was really this time the main author behind the tool, um, uh, implemented an automatic parameter estimation in the tool itself. So you no longer, like with other tools, have to guess if I'm trusting now 10 reads, or I'm trusting 8 reads, or I'm trusting 5 reads, or I'm trusting 12 reads. This is taken care of, basically. So of course, because of this automatization, you might ask, how does it perform with other tools that we also optimized in terms of parameters? And this is the short answer of it. It performs actually pretty well. So on the top, you see Bug Bio HiFi uh, data set. On the bottom, you see Nanopore, Oxford, Oxford Nanopore data sets. And on the right, left side with default recommended parameter, and on the right side we try to improve the parameters on the other tools. The result remains basically the same, that Sniffles 2 is performing faster and more accurate than the other tools itself. We went a little bit further um, and assessed the benchmark uh, that we recently published in February together with Genome on the Bottle, 
which are really focusing on this tricky medical relevant gene around a set of 400 genes encompassing 200 structure variants. You can see that it's actually a little bit more trickier to get these things right, so our performance is a little bit lower from over 90% to around 75%. But still it holds true that uh, sniffles compared to the second most accurate me method, QDSV, was around 10 times faster, and sniffles compared to the second fastest method, as VIM, uh, was around 12% more accurate really performing well. So where are we kind of applying this method now? Well, there are two things I wanted to highlight for this. Uh, first of all, we applied it in a telomere to telomere project where sniffles was used as QC method for the assembly itself. Um, the other method was you and Ashley's talk uh, in the beginning of yesterday where it was used in the rapid nanopore sequencing, which was really a great milestone and his team is also over here in the audience. Uh, had a couple of great talks yesterday. Uh, where we did a re from blood draw to report really in seven hours and 18 minutes, and I cannot stress how great this is. Uh, both of the projects actually earned a Guinness Book World Record entry, which was amazing. So, but this is not everything, right? This is just like single sample, the guy from Sniffles 1 introducing Sniffles 2, meh, right? We can see a clear trend, for example, in this review that we published last year, that the numbers of studies are constantly increasing, not just that are using long read sequencing, but also that are using multiple tens or hundreds of thousands of long read sequences, genomes. So to cope with that, we need something that works on this kind of scale and level, Don't, not just improve the single sample calling itself. So traditionally, for example, with QDSV, we would do a single sample SV calling, then merging, for example, with survivor, uh, then going forward to read genotype, which is important because we need to know if an SV that we observed in sample A is actually present or not in sample B, C, D, or E, right? And then we would merge this again, and then we obtain finally a genotype, a fully genotyped VCF file, which is the base of a lot of association studies of subsequent analysis, right? So with Sniffles 2, we tried to tackle this problem, and so we are not just providing a VCF file, but also a binary file with all the candidates included for a particular sample. And so after single sample calling, we can perform directly a merge inside of Sniffles and provide a fully genotyped UCF file as the output of that first merge. And that actually just takes seconds, 65 seconds in term for the one trio uh, compared to 30, 36 CPU hours for the previous approaches. So we speeded this part up 2,000 times, basically. Um, and not just that, but it actually it solves the n plus one problem. So you, later on, you can add in new runs and new samples, and they are going to be merged in this step, and you still obtain a genotype GCF file. Whereas in the previous approach, you would have to rerun more than half of the entire pipeline. Uh, furthermore, it also improves the tumor versus normal comparison itself, which was really something that we are interested in as well as for Mendelian diseases, the comparison within a family, for example. So how good or how bad is this? Well, the first thing that we approached for this was the Mendelian uh, consistency rate. So here you see sniffles on the left side. Um, on the blue bar, you see the consistent genotypes across the family. Uh, this is, again, the gene the bottle family. You see in red the inconsistent genotypes, and like some of them might be still things that we have to fix, but like some of that, I think, is still um, true and interesting biology, maybe. And then in yellow, you can maybe squint at it, there's a few sites where we are missing a genotype. And that is by default when uh, we have only five reads uh, coverage on, on that one particular site. So then we don't make a call because that's too sketchy, right? But it can be changed. Um, next is QDSV simply with merging. Uh, so no read genotyping yet. Um, we can see that this, of course, results in a larger numbers of uh, non-specified genotypes in yellow, um, and therefore also a lower consistency uh, rate on the comparison in the trio. And then further, more on the right side, we see the results of the 36-hour run, um, which seems, or which basically resulted in a little bit less consistency of structure variance compared to sniffles, a higher inconsistency, and still a fraction larger fraction of missing genotypes overall. So all this looks pretty promising, I would say, right? Uh, the interesting fun fact, we also, of course, um, tried this uh, multiple times and merged 768 genomes, which is basically the trio set, multiple times all over the place. And if you merge this many of genomes, it just takes 15 hours. 
which is around two times still faster than merging a tree over the original approach. So we settled out and applied this in a cohort of 31 genomes that we sequenced with nanopore and a Mendelian disease. Here, uh, the phenotype was a profound neurological and developmental uh, delay in affected males, uh, which is infected by, uh, by MACB2 gene. So the MACB2 gene is on the x-axis, and it's particularly a kind of a nasty spot of the x-axis, uh, sorry. Like uh, X chromosome, um, and it's particularly in a nasty spot. So I'm going to show you an, one program example that is particularly tricky, and where we are still need some work, quite frankly. So what do you see here is in orange, you see the annotation of segmental duplications in this region. Uh, on top of the orange bars, you see the microarray, the copy number array data that we obtained. So you can see on the red dots, basically, that there's a duplication going on in this region. The interesting part indicated by this little blue arrow is that there is actually a triplication, and the triplication is actually inverted. So you have a duplication on top of a triplication, <laughs> and the whole thing is inverted itself. So what sniffles can do here in this, in this case, or the family comparison, is identify this kind of bluish-greenish bar, immediately pointing out that this region is of interest because there is a de novo variant within like minutes, basically. What sniffles right now cannot do is kind of resolve the entire allele. So we can identify that there's an inversion going on in this case, in this program, for example, that sniffles calls out. However, we currently cannot really resolve the entire allele. And part of this is a good excuse, I think, is if we would report the fully resolved allele, it would actually violate the VCF standards right now, I think. Um, another case, as I already teased out, we are also looking into two more normal cases. Is this um, very well-studied sample of Colo 829. Um, where you see in the upper track the normal um, sample, and the lower track you see the cancer sample. And it just takes a couple of minutes to identify this spot as potentially interesting, which is a deletion across two exons of P10, which is a really important gene in cancer research, and a cancer tribal mutation maybe. So this has been great. Um, where are we applying it again? Well, I wanted to highlight basically two large consortiums that I'm part of. One is Gregor. So Gregor is uh, in, in, in Baylor College of Medicine. We are trying to solve uh, unsolved Mendelian diseases of samples that we have collected and studied over the last 10 years with different technologies. We are using Nanopore for this as well as Sniffles 2 um, to identify more complex events as, as, as one uh, as I just showed you. The other one is the maybe even more interesting one, which is All of Us. So for those of you who are not familiar, All of Us is a large project in the USA um, sequencing one million individuals on a clinical crate with Illumina and uh, assessing two million people with microarrays. Um, and the interesting part is that the variants that we are finding over some mechanisms are getting reported back to the individuals directly, which is quite different to the traditional approach. And I'm happy to announce that actually Nanopur will be also a part of this, of course on the research side and not on the clinical side, but I'm really excited about seeing how the technology will work with these samples and what we can learn in this cohort from that. So, so far, everything has been kind of straightforward. We find like a homozygous variant, we find a heterozygous variant, we're all happy, compare a few samples, all is great. Now it gets a little bit more tricky, because the last part that we are was interesting with Sniffles 2 in was to identify low variant frequency. So these are SVs that are particularly tricky, but I think they're really important that we are looking more and more in that because they are playing a role in neurogenitive disorders, in cancer drivers, um, and in potentially many other fields we just haven't looked maybe at it. So what do I mean with that? So the first thing, what I mean with that is this example. We have uh, coverage of like ADX with oxo nanopore, and we have three reads indicating an insertion. And we want to call that correctly. So to assess Sniffles 2 and its mode, uh, that we call non-germinal mode, for assessing these variances, we mixed in different concentrations HG002 into HG004. So HG004 is the mother of that proband. Um, and then we count, then we basically evaluated again how many of these insertion deletions and other re rearrangements we can identify at this low coverage. And so the plot in the middle is showing you the results. So on the y-axis, you see the uh, fraction of recall. On the x-axis, you see basically the variant ID fraction for these variants. Uh, the first curve is the blue curve, which is basically flat and doesn't call anything because that's our germline mode. 
um, that wouldn't call anything at this low resolution or this low frequency level. In orange now, we can, we can see how much we can recall based on a given variant allele frequency. So if we have a variant allele frequency rate of 7 or 5 or 7 percent, we can re-identify 40 percent or a little bit less than 40 percent of the structure variance in a 55x coverage data set. And this is pretty cool because, like, of course, if you pump up the coverage, you would see more. So the basic limitation here is that heterozygous SVs are sometimes just indica indicated by a single read, and we cannot yet trust a single read, right? You see that in the gray curve that is the implementation of genotyping in sniffles to itself. When we increase the variant allele frequency to 10%, we can uh, recover around 60%, 59, 60% of the structure variance at the frequency spectrum, and then at 15%, around 80% or 75%, and then at 20%, we fully recover the whole set uh, with, just five, with just basically one flow cell of Oxford nanopore. Um, the reason why our recall is a little bit lower than the genotyping is, of course, we wanted to keep up the precision, right? It's easy to call everything, but like a precision also has to keep up with it. So in blue, you see the precision on our default mode, germline mode, and in orange, you see the precision of this mode. So it's a little bit reduced, but overall pretty good. So of course, we sent out and, and wanted to apply this, and we are working together with Christos from UCL over here. Um, I'm also going for dinner with him. I'm looking forward to this. Um, and into, we, we, we took a, a sample from a brain from MSA patient, which is a rare neurological disorder. And as Chris also always says, it's basically Parkinson-like symptoms. Um, so Sniffles 2 non germline mode really identified multiple, in the, multiple structure variants, the low frequency level in this brain sample. I'm just highlighting one of which here, which is a small um, SDR contraction of like 50 base pairs, 40, 50 base pairs, visible in these three reads um, that was discovered in the KCN IP14, which is uh, important for neurological um, disease and get, uh, related to a passium channel. Uh, we validated multiple structure variants by overlapping them with a high coverage Illumina data set, as well as with a 600x coverage bio nano data set, and found a good validation rate actually, uh, given the limitations of both technologies. So where are, we validate, where are we kind of applying this? Well, one of the, one of the things where we're applying this is the Center of Alzheimer's and Related Dementia card at the NIH directly, which is setting out to sequence 4,000 brain samples uh, with Oxford Nanopore, identifying rare mutations in these brain samples across three different neurological diseases, as well as one study control cohort. The variants and the epigenetic data will be available as a data resource for subsequent studies. However, the other thing which is really, really interesting and really happy about this is the great collaboration with the Marathon of Hope. Um, people, Kieran, gave a fantastic talk and some of his teams uh, where we are already having nanopore sequencing done over cancer and normal samples. And I'm really, really happy um, to look into um, how these structural variants manifest themselves, maybe even in the Illumina RNA-seq data to see if they have some cause in isoforms of expression. So, so far, this is kind of Sniffles 2 story, and I hope you agree this is really kind of moving the field hopefully forward. And I'm looking forward to hearing, of course, many talks how this new tool really helps you to identify structural variants further, also at this low variant allele frequency level. However, if you know me, I like to kind of push it a little bit more than it's maybe healthy. So, when we think about these things, right, on bulk nanopore data, as I just showed you, the variant allele frequency that we can identify is really dependent on the coverage that we have in the sample, right? If you sequence 100x nanopore, which is this time kind of possible, you can go lower in variant frequency. But we also have, cannot go too low because at some point we are hitting this problem with the error rate, what is believable and what is not, right? On the other side, what Christos and others are doing is, of course, doing single-cell DNA sequencing with Illumina. So there we can identify variants per cell, and I'm just showing you three tracks on the right side here, uh, from the same brain sample, different regions. And you see remarkable differences between these individual tracks in terms of copy numbers. The sad part, however, is that we don't know where these copies, um, where these duplications actually start and stop. We have a window of like plus minus 500 kV 
of where these breakpoints are. I have no idea if gene A is impacted or gene B is impacted, right? Furthermore, I have no idea what else we are missing because that we are missing a ton of structural variants in these samples, right? And the third thing, we have no idea about the sequence or resolution of these alleles, right? If you have a transposon insertion or something like that happening, like the previous speaker pointed out, we will never find this, right? So the big question that Christos and I was coming up with, like, can we combine these two techniques? Can we do single cell whole genome sequencing with Oxford Nanopore itself? Short answer is yes, we can. So this is just one of the first runs that we did from many to come. And this is all the reads are coming from one single cell. There's no pool, there's no nothing, just one single cell. You can see nice repeat expansions, you can see in larger insertions, and we can see deletions on these data sets already. And there are some optimizations that have to happen in the lab and on the, on the bioinformatics side, but we are working on this. And I'm super, super thrilled about this because this is the first conference that I could show this data set. So, to summarize, so today I talked to you guys about Sniffles 2. I hope it finds applications in your lab and I hope it's driving your research forward. I'm really looking forward to see all the uh, use cases in this. It really, I think, improves structural variant calling and accuracy and speed provides a population mode, which hopefully solves a lot of problems. It has also a mosaic SV mode, which hopefully lead to new insights into brains, cancer, and other um, important topics. And then I just teased you a little bit with what we are looking at and starting to look at, which is single cell whole genome sequencing with Oxford Nanopore. And I think the boundaries are are not existing. I'm pretty, pretty thrilled about this part to detect SMVs, structure variants, same way as we are used to with bug sequencing data. So in the end, I want to thank my lab. Uh, Louis and Moritz really did all, almost all the work in this case. Uh, Robesh did a nice talk previously on SDR SPY in the previous session. Um, I'm really happy to work with the team at Human Genome Sequencing Center, Rice University, as well as, of course, great collaborations in UCL, PNRI, Thanks for funding on the right side. And like, if you're interested in this kind of work or want to pursue something like this, then please really reach out to me. Uh, we are looking for multiple people in my lab to, to join us in this endeavor. And thank you so much for listening and inviting me again. Happy to take any questions.